Welcome, and thank you for joining us once again as we walk through the uh, the letter of 1 Corinthians. I think this uh, this particular book is very relevant to our culture today, and uh, this morning's, or, you know, the lesson we're going to cover is uh, definitely talking about freedom, which I know strikes a chord with most Americans in our culture. Freedom is a major theme. Um, but Paul has a different take on freedom, and uh, so let's get into it. All things to all people. For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. To the Jews I became as a Jew, in order to win Jews. To those under the law I became as one under the law though not being myself under the law, that I might win those under the law. To those outside the law, I became as one outside the law, not being outside the law of God, but under the law of Christ, that I might win those outside the law. To the weak, I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, that I may share with them in its blessings. Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things, they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we an imperishable. So I do not run aimlessly. I do not box as one beating the air, but I discipline my body and keep it under control lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. What's Paul talking about here? He's talking about freedom and yet he has a different take on it. He, he looks at it in an unusual manner, to say the least. But let's catch the context here. You've got a church that's filled with division. You've got different groups claiming to have superior knowledge, uh, superior spiritual maturity, superior understanding based on who they follow, whose teachings they follow, um, their own spiritual growth. And, and they seem to be rubbing this freedom, this spiritual, super spiritual maturity in each other's faces, discouraging and demeaning the others instead of encouraging them. And Paul has a big problem with that. So they're, they're saying that, that, that our, our superior knowledge forces us to behave in ways that are very, very ungodly, unchristlike. They're, they're talking about freedom in Christ in unchristlike ways. And Paul is just not having it. He's letting them know that uh, your understanding of freedom is really messed up. It's creating divisions in the church. It's creating a bad reputation from outsiders towards the church. If you're doing anything that's actually dividing, destroying, and, and creating a bad reputation, you, you're not doing something right. Something's really wrong with the understanding. And that's what Paul's trying to get across to these first century Corinthian Christians. What's his ministry principle? For though I am free from all, I have made myself a servant to all, that I might win more of them. And the word he uses here, servant, can uh, can mean a slave as well, servant or a slave. And so, uh, you know, Paul's saying, uh, you know, we we use our freedom to actually serve. It's not a freedom to destroy. It's not a freedom to, you know, lord over someone else or to to discourage them or demean them in any way. Our, our freedom should result in service, not in superiority or arrogance. You see, if our freedom is going to hinder the gospel, Paul says you need to enslave that freedom for the sake of the gospel. 
You hear what he's saying? It's definitely a play on words. He's saying if you want to be free, you've got to become a slave. You've got to become a servant. That's the Christian approach to freedom. And unfortunately, both the first century Corinthian Christians and many Christians today have the same problem. They view the freedom as a way to, to do whatever they want to, even if it hurts someone else, even if it destroys relationships, even if it maybe destroys and hinders the gospel of Jesus Christ. And that's just the wrong way to look at it. Being free means that we're free to enslave the exercise of our freedom so that God will be glorified, so that his message will be heard. You see the way Paul's looking at this. He, he has no trouble, and I know we don't like to talk about slavery and, and American slavery kind of taints all of our thinking when, when the subject comes up, but the fact of the matter is the Christian approach to freedom is to enslave ourselves to the gospel of Jesus Christ for the glory of God and the spread of his message. To the weak I became weak, that I might win the weak. I have become all things to all people, that by all means I might save some. Now, Paul is clearly being accused of hypocrisy. They're saying, well, you behave this way with Jews and you behave this way with Gentiles. That seems very hypocritical. The fact of the matter is, he, he did that. Uh, Paul accused the Apostle Peter of this very thing. Uh, when they had the controversy and they had to go down to Jerusalem to work it out, but he accused Peter. He said, hey, when you're with Jews, you withdrew from the Gentiles. You're, you're, you're being a Jew with the Jews are here, but, but you were treating the Gentiles like second-class Christians, and when the Jews weren't here, you were behaving like a Gentile and eating their food. So uh, what's going on here? Paul accused Peter of being hypocritical. And then here he says, he seems to be saying he's doing the same thing. But it actually isn't. It's very, very different. See, Paul is advocating cultural and spiritual accommodation, not hypocrisy. And what that means is you consider who you're talking to. You consider the context that you're in. Paul didn't have any trouble with Peter sitting with the Jewish Christians. He had a problem with him treating the Gentile Christians as second-class Christians, as not truly spiritual if they didn't follow the Jewish culture laws. And that was what that whole uh, Jerusalem conference was about. Do you have to become a Jew to become a Christian? And, and Paul very clearly was saying, no, you do not have to become a Jew to become a Christian. Here he's talking about considering your audience. Consider who you're with and behave appropriately, and how do you determine what's appropriate? For the sake of the gospel. What is going to most likely reach the people that you're around? And, and you need to, to speak openly and talk about your knowledge, what is, you know, with last uh, on our last lesson we talked about uh, eating meat sacrificed to idols, and that there were some Corinthian Christians that just couldn't handle that. They hadn't really become monotheistic in their worldview yet. And that by some Christians eating that meat, it would cause them to stumble. They would actually lose their faith. And Paul's continuing that same argument here. He's saying, consider who you're with and behave appropriately for the sake of the gospel, whether they're already Christians or whether they're not Christians yet. And so when you're in a different place, you, you, you culturally accommodate, you spiritually accommodate uh, not because you're a hypocrite, but because you recognize that our freedom in Christ is to be used to spread the message of Jesus Christ, to spread the gospel. And so, yes, when you're in different places, you would behave differently. Um, you know, a lot of us like to go to the beach. We get our swimsuits on and we go to the beach. But most people wouldn't wear their swimsuits into church on Sunday morning. That would be inappropriate. But at the beach, it's very appropriate. When I was uh, working in Kenya, they have their own cultural issues. And uh, men and women do not touch each other in public. 
And so when we were in Kenya doing mission work, trying to plant churches and spread the gospel, my wife and I did not touch each other in public. We actually had some Americans come and visit, and when they went home, they reported that we have a bad marriage because they never saw us touch each other in public. Well, that's, that's American culture. That would have been very inappropriate in a Kenyan culture. Were we being hypocritical? No, we were accommodating the culture so that we might win some. We might be able to spread the gospel more effectively. They even have some uh, unusual views towards food. In, uh, in Kenya, yellow corn is for animals. White corn is for humans. Well, I kind of look at it differently. I, I kind of prefer yellow corn to white corn. I, I don't mind eating either one. But, but if we had Kenyans over to our house, it would have been completely inappropriate for us to serve yellow corn to them. They would have taken that as an insult, as highly offensive that we're treating them like animals. And so we never served yellow corn to the Kenyans when they came to our house. Was that being hypocritical? No, that's just accommodating the culture so that we might have an audience be more open to hearing the gospel. And that's what Paul's talking about here. We were free. We felt free to eat yellow corn when we weren't with Kenyans, but we never served it to them or even ate it in front of them when we were trying to reach them and share the gospel, having a Bible study in any context. See, Christians have to adjust their message and behavior based on the context in which we find ourselves in. Right now, we have, we have a culture clash uh, between our generations, between the baby boomers and the Gen Xs and the millennials and whatever's coming after that. Uh, there's, a, there's very different views. Every Sunday in our congregation, we have people walk in in suits and ties. And we have some people walk in in shorts and t-shirts and flip-flops. And I've heard the people in suits and ties complain about the people in shorts and flip-flops. And I've heard the people in shorts and flip-flops complain about the people wearing suits. It, it, it's, we have different cultures actually existing within our congregation. And again, depending on who you're with, you need to accommodate. And sometimes the accommodation is to allow someone else to dress the way they want to without shaming them, without trying to put them down or demean them. And, and we've had those struggles. I've heard, you know, some of the people in suits and ties just extremely upset and even saying disparaging things to the people who they think are not dressing appropriately. All the while not understanding that the people in the shorts and flip-flops thinks the suit and tie is inappropriate. It's, it's a, uh, it's almost like you're trying to look good since you aren't really good inside. You know, you're putting on an outside sort of a fake persona. It's just a different perspective. And a lot of these things are not right or wrong in and of themselves. They're just a different worldview. And that, in our case, is what has to be accommodated. Let people wear what they want to wear to church. All people are welcome no matter what they're wearing. We do ask that you wear something, but uh, as long as you have something on, we, you know, we invite you to come and join us and feel welcome here, no matter how you're dressed. This is maturity versus the immaturity. You need to understand, when, when people do something that you don't understand, you need to understand why they do it before you try to correct or modify it. As a missionary, I was given the advice that my first year, I just should keep my mouth shut. The second year, um, I might actually ask a few questions. And the third year, I might venture some opinions. And the whole idea was you need to, to watch, you need to listen, you need to understand before you start talking and giving your opinion. You need to actually get into people's lives and understand why they do what they do. Um, you know, we had to do that in Kenya. They did a lot of things we just didn't understand until we sat down and just asked a lot of questions and, and finally understood what they were going. Most Kenyans uh, had this idea they would come into the city, make a lot of money, and then retire back to their homeland, back to their, their tribal land. 
Um, what they didn't seem to understand is their children who grew up in the city were not going to go back to their tribal land. They were going to stay in the city. And so, but we needed to understand what was going on there and why they didn't want to put permanent, you know, they, they wanted to rent instead of buy in the city. Uh, they, it was harder to buy land and, and build buildings in the city uh, because this was a transitory place in their minds. And so we had to understand that before we could sort of work through the issues of actually buying land and building buildings in the cities, not to mention this, the churches that were built out in their tribal homelands. But you got to sit down and listen. You actually actually get involved with people's lives before you try to straighten them out on some particular issue. There's an old saying, but a very good one. People don't care how much we know unless they know how much we care. You see, if I know someone really cares about me, they can tell me anything. They can criticize me, and I know they have my best interest at heart. But if I don't think they care about me, it's not likely I'm going to listen to much they say. That's just how people work. That's human nature. And so you need to really get involved with people before you try to straighten out any behavior that they're involved in. You need to understand why they're doing it. Paul's saying that we need to willingly give up our rights, our freedoms, in order to reach those with different understandings of the world. And, and certainly as a missionary, we had to do that a lot. We, we had to eat a lot of things that we wouldn't normally eat. We had to dress appropriately. We, we couldn't touch each other in public, me and my wife, because that was just seen as, as inappropriate. And we had to just be very careful about those things so that we could reach people who saw the world a little bit differently. Why? For the sake of the gospel. I do it all for the sake of the gospel, Paul says, that I might share with them in its blessings. You see, the very nature of the gospel is sacrifice. Jesus said, if you want to follow me, you've got to take up your cross and follow me. That's a death march. We're, we're, we're literally giving up our lives to live for Jesus when we become Christians. That's, that's one of the major messages of the gospel, so that we can share with them in its blessings. Paul wants all of us to know that, we're, that Christianity, your faith, is so much bigger than we are. Your church community is so much bigger than we are. That, 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 that we're, a, we're a solid body of Christ trying to show the rest of the world who Jesus really is. And that's bigger than any one of us or any one of our particular desires. That we need to be willing to sacrifice anything for the bigger picture of the gospel of Jesus Christ. See, the very gospel that saves us from our sins, and again, we tend to look at it selfishly, but you know, people say, why did you become a Christian? Well, I want to be saved. I, I wanted my sins to be washed away. And, and, and that's fine, and that's what that does, but, but it, there's a bigger picture here. It's to become a part of the body of Christ, a part of the church of Christ. And, and so, any, you know, this gospel that saves us, it needs to get out to the rest of the world. We, it's not something you, you get and hide. It's something you get and share. When, when you have good news, you, you just want to share it. And that's actually what the gospel means, is good news. If you get a promotion and a raise at work, if you happen to win some money or get a nice inheritance, if, uh, you know, someone gives you free tickets to... Uh, to a ball game or something, you, you tend to say, hey, that's great. I've got some good news. I just got some free tickets. We, you, you're just bursting with the desire to share that. Well, that's what the gospel is. And, and, and this gospel has got to get out. We're, we're not only become saved, but we need to extend and share that message of salvation with everyone around us, no matter what we have to sacrifice to do so. And I know a lot of people that this is where it gets tough. You know, hey, I don't mind sharing my faith as long as it doesn't cost me much. But if I actually have to start sacrificing, if I have to give up my rights in order to share the gospel, but that's exactly what Paul's saying. He's saying the freedom 
It's the freedom to enslave ourselves, to, to become everyone else's servant. Jesus himself said, the greatest among you will be the servant of all. It's the very nature of the gospel. And then Paul gets into sports metaphors. I find this section interesting. He says, listen, every athlete exercises self-control in all things. Anyone who knows anything about sports knows if you don't practice, if you don't exercise, you're not going to be very good at it. You have to keep, keep practicing. And uh, every athlete understands that. And so Paul's letting these Corinthians say, being free does not mean being undisciplined. That, that freedom in Christ means we've got to learn how to share the gospel. We've got to learn how to encourage one another. There's all those one another passages that we're called to lift each other up and to bear one another's burdens. And that, that, that the, the practice of Christianity, the freedom we have in Christ is the freedom to be everyone else's servant. We're, it's a disciplined practice. And so... Uh, and, you know, one of the messages I constantly share with my members is if you think Sunday morning is all there is to it, you're missing the whole point. That Christianity is about sharing your faith, whether in behavior, in words, in any other way, that we share our faith in just the way we live day to day, whether how we treat our coworkers, how we treat our neighbors, how we treat that guy that just cut you off on the freeway. Um, our Christianity needs to come out of our pores, and it certainly needs to start at home. How do we treat our family? And, and are, we, are we doing things that encourage and lift up, or are we doing things that destroy and tear down? It needs to be a constant reminder that we are here for the sake of the gospel, and that, that means my, I start with my wife and my children. They need to see the gospel in me on a daily basis. Paul says, I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. This is a fascinating statement. Here's the Apostle Paul letting all of us know that if you don't get disciplined about your faith, we could be disqualified. You ever think about that? You know, here's the Apostle Paul saying, listen, I've got to keep at it. I've got to stay disciplined. I've got to keep up my practice my behavior, my thinking, the words that come out of my mouth, or I might get disqualified. If I'm, if I'm practicing my Christian freedoms in a way that destroys others around me in unchristlike ways, I could be disqualified. And that's something almost anybody who's involved in sports knows. You, you can be thrown out of a game for unsportsmanlike conduct. And Paul's saying... You can get thrown out of this game for unchristian-like conduct. So we need to keep that in mind. We need to, uh, you know, we've got the saying, it's not whether you win or lose, it's how you play the game. Well, that's exactly what Paul's saying. It's how we play the game. Winning is playing by God's rules, not our own. So where's the gospel in this passage? I, I don't think you can miss it. Freedom in Christ means freedom to become everyone else's servant. Freedom in Christ means sacrificing our rights for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of those around us. It means a willingness to accommodate those around us, even at our own suffering, perhaps. that, that, that we, we have to be willing to sacrifice and even suffer for the sake of others so that they can hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. You see, the difference between freedom and freedom in Christ is that just freedom, and, I, and I'm talking especially to Americans, but I think this is a human nature issue, but we often, freedom is all about ourselves. I'm free to do whatever I want to, and I've heard people say that so many times. That's a focus on the self, whereas freedom in Christ means we're focused on being Christ-like. That we literally, when we, are, when we identify with Jesus Christ through baptism, with his death, burial, and resurrection, we are saying, I'm dying to myself, and I'm going to live the rest of my life for Jesus Christ, for the sake of the gospel. That is the gospel. And we need to keep that in mind on a daily basis. Because we've all got to sacrifice 
for the sake of the gospel, whether it's giving of our time, whether it's giving of our money, whether it's getting up in the middle of the night to help somebody, whether it's counseling or just being a good listener, we need to be willing to sacrifice so that some might be saved. All things to all men, to all people, so that some might be saved. What's Paul saying here? Well, he seems to be telling all of us, it's not about you or me. It's all about God. And that's one of my favorite sayings. We need to remember that daily, that, that, that getting our eyes off ourself and focusing on doing what God has called me to do on a daily basis is one of the key ingredients to becoming a faithful Christian. Because it's so easy to just start thinking about myself. And I know this goes completely against our American culture. Our American culture says, oh, you've got to be you. You've got to be honest to yourself. You've got to be true to yourself. You need to take care of yourself. Take care of you first because no one else will. That's not Christian. The Bible says you take care of God. You take care of what God has called you to do. And God will take care of you right through this life, right through death, and into eternity, living in his presence, standing around the throne of God, singing praises to God. I'm not sure what it's going to be like, but I'm pretty sure it's going to be awesome. So let's keep that in mind. It's not about you and me. It's all about God, and that's exactly what Paul is saying in this particular section of Scripture. Thank you for joining us.